Good morning. Good to see everyone out this morning. We're so happy to see everyone that has made it out here. We want to welcome our visitors. We want you to know that you are our honored guests. We're happy that you've chosen to be with us this morning. We also want to say a thank you to all those who might be joining us on our live stream. You found us on our YouTube channel, Courthouse Church of Christ, and we are happy that you are tuning in this morning. This morning's lesson is entitled, A Psalm for Thanksgiving. We're going to be looking in Psalm 100. In fact, <clears throat> I took as the title for my lesson, the title given to this psalm, A Psalm for Thanksgiving. And I want to tell you the, the wrestle I had this week. I had it in my mind to combine three psalms of thanksgiving, as well as uh, the passage of the ten lepers from Luke 17. And as I sat down, it took me a couple days to realize this wasn't going to work, not the way it was in my head. And so I decided on a different course of action. We're going to be looking at Psalm 100 today. Then we're going to be looking at Psalm 103 next Sunday, uh, the week before Thanksgiving. And then after Thanksgiving, we're going to be looking at Psalm 116. And somewhere in there, I plan to uh, mix in the thoughts behind the 10 leper story from Luke 17. So it's going to be a uh, psalm of thanksgiving series, if you will, over the next three weeks. It's going to be the theme of, of thanksgiving. The world around us is preparing to enter, as they call, the holiday season. And there are some people, as you go to the store, they want to jump from Halloween directly to Christmas. And somehow Thanksgiving gets forgotten. But our country has a holiday about thanksgiving, about giving thanks. A holiday means a day that has been set aside. Our country has set aside a day to give thanks. And I think it is important. They've set aside the third Thursday of November, making this year's Thanksgiving fall this year on November 23rd. And the holidays can be a fun time of cheer and family traditions. But as we've all seen, it also becomes a time of great discontent greed, and ingratitude. And unfortunately, even some Christians can fall into this trap. It's an easy trap to fall into because sale, sale here, sale there, and things you didn't even know that you wanted or needed are on sale, and all of a sudden it's all about the stuff. And it's, it's hard to sit back and be just thankful for what you have been blessed with and be content. Christians aren't just to be thankful one time a year and I know that that's not the intent of the holiday of Thanksgiving any more than Mother's Day or Father's Day. We all understand it's not just one day of the year that we're to show appreciation, but it is a neat thing that there is a day set aside just to give thanks. And Christians aren't just <clears throat> to be thinking of thanks on this one day because it's a holiday and the rest of the nation is doing that. But in fact, Colossians 3.17 that Brother George just read for us tells us, Christians are to make a habit of giving thanks for all things at all times. And so this is supposed to be the uh, trait of our heart, a character, if you will, of our walk with God of being thankful. And there are multiple places in God's word that contain calls and reasons for giving thanks. And I, I was doing a, a word search and I read an article on it and I saw that there's about to, it's estimated there's 270 occurrences of the word thanks or giving thanks or thanksgiving throughout the scriptures. And rather than a lesson hopping all around the various places in the scriptures to talk about thanks, I thought we'd concentrate on one passage today, one psalm. And so let's turn to Psalm 100. Psalm 100. The ancient title for this psalm is a psalm for thanksgiving. We're not told who the author is. In the place where it might say a psalm of David or a psalm of Solomon or a psalm of the sons of Korah, where instead of the, where the author place would be, it tells us it's a psalm for thanksgiving. And so we want to talk about this psalm. It's also affectionately known as Old Hundredth. Because of its tune in the Geneva Psalter, it was a songbook or hymnal published in 1551. And if you want to get a head start, I'm, I plan to read the words from this Geneva Psalter as published in 1551. It's also referred to as a Scottish Psalter. <clears throat> if you want to get a jump on that, it's hymn 60 in our hymn book in the pews, uh, Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs. It's hymn number 60. 
And the words are going to be updated in that hymn. I'm going to read their language or the words a little later on as they were published in 1551. And you'll notice if you look at that hymn, if you're already jumping ahead of me and looking at those words, you're going to notice as you read Psalm 100, this is kind of a summary of Psalm 100 put to, to music so that it can be sang. Some have also called this psalm the psalm of the pilgrims or the pilgrims psalm. This was a psalm especially cherished by the Puritans who felt it was an appropriate description of their experiences in coming to the new world. And so it might even be that this psalm was on the mind of the pilgrims as they celebrated the harvest feast that later came to be known as Thanksgiving. So let's read together Psalm 100. It says it's a psalm for thanksgiving. It says, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness is To all generations. Psalm 100 is a very short psalm, it's just five verses. But I want us to observe as we go through this lesson the psalmist's call for thanks and the cause for thanks, because he gives both call and cause in this brief psalm. So let's talk about the call to give thanks from Psalm 100, verses 1 through 2, and then verse 4. We just read all five. But, and you'll notice that in this first section, we're skipping three and five. We're going to go one to two and then four. He says, first, shout joyfully to the Lord. I like the ESV because I think it's, it's mostly what I do. The ESV says, make a joyful noise. <laughs> make a joyful noise. You know, it says, shout joyfully to the Lord or make a joyful noise. Whatever it is, the Hebrew word here means to shout, to sing loudly. The joyful noise from the English Standard Version, it means it's a passionate, heartfelt sound that comes from the heart. And we're not going to make any jokes this morning about brother or sister always, you know, brother or sister so-and-so always making a joyful noise when they think they're singing. We knew a woman who sang very loudly, long ago, years ago at a congregation we were at. She sang very loudly. She sang off key every single time. But she loved to sing, and she sang out, and nobody minded. The song leaders even loved her because sometimes we would lead songs we didn't know all the way, and she was right there with the words and guiding, helping us out. We all loved her for it. And to God... That was a joyful noise. That was shouting joyfully because she was singing from her heart. You could hear her. There are others in the congregation, but you didn't hear them, but you heard her. Sing out. That's what this is talking about. Sing with gusto. It's not the near silent murmuring of words. It's a proclamation from the rooftops. It's shouting to God from our lungs. Does that describe your singing? Does that describe your praise to God? That's what what Psalm 100 is telling us to do. Shout joyfully to the Lord. It also says, shout all the earth. It says all the earth. This is a reminder that all of the earth is subject to God. Everyone on earth ought to be giving thanks and praise to the Lord. We're all invited to come to him. Philippians 2.10 says every knee will bow. So on earth, every knee should bow. Because every knee will bow at one point. We get to verse 2 and it says, serve the Lord. Considering the context here under the law of Moses, the service here would be referring to the offering of sacrifice or burnt offerings or all the different various sacrifices there were under the law of Moses to God. To worship is to show adoration. There's a Greek word in the New Testament that Jesus uses in John 4, 23 to 24, when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well in Samaria. And he's talking about there's a mountain that the, the Samaritans believe they were to worship on. And God is saying, and Jesus is there telling her, there's coming a time when it won't matter where you worship because God is spirit and God wants us to worship in spirit. That word that he uses is the Greek word. It's Strong's 4352. 
and it's proskuneo. And it means to prostrate oneself, to bow down before the object of worship. And so it means a, a literal bowing down before something or someone. In this case, Jesus is talking about Almighty God prostrating yourself before him. This is the, the idea here behind this Hebrew word of serving the Lord is to worship him. Some English versions actually render this as worship the Lord. And that's what we're being called to do. So as we know the context here, it kind of helps us frame the rest of the psalm in this way of our service is worship to God. It says serve the Lord. It also says in verse 2, after saying serve, it says with gladness. This is telling us we're not... This is not telling us that this is a drudgery or something that we have to drag our feet to. And I know that happens on Sunday morning. Your alarm goes off early and we're just saying, oh, I just don't want to get out of bed. But then we remember what day it is and what we are called to do, what we get to do. It is a grand opportunity to assemble with the saints in this area, that we might with one voice lift our praises up to him in song, that we might together study from his word, be built up, strengthened, and edified. And then it becomes a glorious day. It becomes a beautiful day, something we ought to be looking forward to. The admonition then is to approach the Lord with gladness in our hearts. Does this, does this express your desire in coming on Sunday mornings? Or is it, ah, well, I have to be there. No, we get to be here. We get to be here to serve the, the Lord of the universe, to serve our creator. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Verse 2 also says, come into his presence. Again, as I think about the context here under the law of Moses, and I think about the Israelites and their, their burnt offerings and their different uh, worship practices under the law of Moses, the picture I get when I hear come into his presence is looking back to ancient Israel of what that meant to them. That meant at one time coming to the tabernacle. Then under the, the time of the kings, especially Solomon and forward, it meant coming before the temple. There was a courtyard there just as there was in the tabernacle and all the people were able to come to the temple and experience the presence of the Lord because the Ark of the Covenant was there. <clears throat> Whether you were a Jew going to the tabernacle or the temple, this in their time period was considered coming into the presence of God. In David's great psalm of repentance in Psalm 51, as he is expressing his deep remorse, his regret, and seeking forgiveness for his adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband. In Psalm 51, you might remember that he begs God in verse 11, Cast me not away from your presence. Cast me not away from your presence. What he meant was he was literally saying, don't keep me from being able to come and worship you. Don't keep me from coming to your tabernacle. Don't cast me aside from your presence. Not only does it say come into his presence, but it tells us how we're to come into his presence in verse 2. Come with singing. Singing was done in Israel as part of worship. Today it's still a major part of our assembling together. It's not entertainment as many in the religious world view it and are coming out of that. <clears throat> it's not, it's not an a entertainment period of our service to God. It is something deeper with greater meaning to it. It's a sacrifice. Hebrews 13, 15 calls it the fruit of our lips. It is a sacrifice to God when we sing his praises and express our love to him through song. It's important we keep that as our perspective when it comes to our coming into the presence of God in the song. We're, we come before him singing. Remember that shout joyfully. We, we are shouting through song. We're singing his praises as we come into his presence. And we come to verse 4. And it says, enter his gates or his courts. It says, enter his gates and his courts. These things would have certainly brought to mind the tabernacle or the temple for the Jews because both the tabernacle and the temple had its gates and its courts where the people could gather because only the, the Levites, the priests, were able to go into the tabernacle, into the temple, and only the high priests could go into the Holy of Holies, both in the tabernacle and in the temple. But the people were able to gather in the courtyard of both tabernacle and temple. And he says, come into his presence. But I want us to note that it was even an Old Testament concept 
that God's presence couldn't be contained there. In 1 Kings 8 and verse 27, King Solomon recognized that no tabernacle, no temple could hold God because as he dedicated the newly constructed temple to God in his prayer in 1 Kings 8, in verse 27, Solomon wrote, writes, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house which I have built. Solomon recognized that God's presence could not be contained with even the most beautiful of buildings that David laid out the blueprints and Solomon carried out. Solomon at this dedication says, but we know you're not here. Your name will be established here forever as God said it would be. He says, but we know that this building does not contain you. As Christians, we also understand coming into God's presence in a different way. There's not just one building or place that we go to. We can go to God and come into his presence as we close our eyes or look into the heavens and pray to him. We know that we come to God a different way. Stephen in Acts 7, in his sermon to the Sanhedrin, he says in Acts 7, 48 to 49, <clears throat> the most high does not dwell in houses made by hands. And he quotes from Isaiah 66, showing that it is an old covenant and new covenant concept that God is everywhere, that there's no one building that can contain him. So knowing that God is all around us makes it important to think about coming into his presence. That, we, that means we set aside the time to come into his presence. Whether it's here this morning gathered together, assembled with the saints, our brothers and sisters in this local area, or whether it's private time that we set aside that I need to go to God in prayer about something or whatever it is, we come into the presence of God because there's no building that can contain him. <clears throat> when we're all assembled together, it's a great time to remember that we come in his presence. And it tells us, this psalm tells us how we are to come into his presence. It says, enter with thanksgiving, enter with praise. We come into his, his presence. And we need to be thinking about the attitude that we have. Do we come into his presence as we drag ourselves out of bed Sunday morning and we come, we're saying, oh, I, just, I have to be here and that's the only reason I'm here and I can't wait till it's over and I can go home and do what I want to do. God knows and he says he doesn't want that. He wants you to come into his presence with thanksgiving, giving him thanks. He wants you to come into his presence giving him praise because he's blessed us with another day. It's a new day. He's blessed us on Sundays, especially a time that has been set aside to remember Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, and the promise that he will return. <clears throat> when we come into his presence, whether it's singing on our own, praying on our own and joining our hearts and our mind to the public prayer and the public singing. We come into his presence and we do so with thanksgiving and we do so with praise on our lips. We come into his presence with the only gift we truly have to offer him, our sacrifice of gratitude and praise. And I encourage you, we just don't have time this morning. I encourage you to read Psalm 50, 10 to 15. And Psalm 116, verse 12. Again, we're going to be looking at Psalm 116 in about two weeks. So I encourage you to read these on your own and see that when we come into his presence, we're giving him the sacrifice of our gratitude, that is of giving thanks and our praise. And we're simply told in verse 4, give thanks. Simply stated, express your gratitude. That would be their purpose in the coming in the presence of God, of entering his gates and courts when they made sacrifices. Even their sacrifices were telling God, thank you. On one day out of the year, an annual sacrifice on the day of atonement, as it was called, and the lamb would be slaughtered. The lamb without blemish was set aside to be slaughtered for the sins of the people. This was a thank you to God for removing that sin. And what it did was, as we find out in the New Testament, it didn't truly remove it. Hebrews 10, 4, the blood of bulls and goats cannot forgive sin. It just rolled it forward to the next year, as long as that day of atonement kept happening. But it was a day of thanksgiving to thank God for not holding those sins against them any longer. And so even their sin sacrifice was a, 
a big thank you to God. But I want us to remember that not all sacrifices were made for sin. We look in Ezra 3 and verse 5 and find out that some were made as free will offerings, made possibly out of gratitude. In Ezra 3.5, the Jews have just been released from captivity of 70 years by the Babylonians. And Cyrus the Great releases them back to their homeland and charges them to rebuild the temple. And so we find in Ezra 3.5 that all these sacrifices are made according to the law. But then it says the people continued making sacrifices as free will offerings. It meant that they were so filled with gratitude and thanks to God that they just kept on making their sacrifices. And so the old law wasn't just filled with sacrifices for sin. There was free will offerings as well. And Psalm 100 verse 4 says, give thanks and bless his name. Just as God has blessed us, we're called to bless him. This is another way of referring to giving praise. Speaking of the greatness of God, acknowledging his goodness is a way that we bless his name. We praise his name. You know, Brother George read for us earlier, Colossians 3, 15 to 17. I want us to revisit verse 17 because all of us, me included, you, brothers and sisters, we're all called to come to God and offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. It it is what all of us are told to do. Colossians 3, 17 says, whatever you do in word or deed, does this not make up our day in word or deed? We either talking, ask my family, they know. We're either talking or we're doing something, right? He says, whatever you do in word or deed, he said, this makes up your life. Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. We are to, in word and deed, our words and our actions, we are to give praise and thanks to God. And we do so because of and through Jesus Christ. We're called to do it in a different manner from the way the Jews did. But God is no less worthy of our honor and gratitude today than he was then. And he still calls upon us in everything that makes up our life to give thanks to him. In fact, you and I ought to understand the goodness of God in an even deeper way than the psalmist wrote or the Jews of his day. Because we stand on this side of the cross. We've seen God's love, his mercy, his kindness his compassion and grace expressed in the way the writer of this psalm had never seen. John 1.29, John the Baptist, <clears throat> John the Baptizer, or John the Immerser, standing at the Jordan River, after t- talking to the Pharisees and telling them that he is not the Messiah, but the Messiah is coming and he's not worthy to even touch the thongs on his shoes, then it says the next day he sees him coming at the Jordan and he says in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Here is that sacrifice of atonement. Here is that Lamb of God, unblemished, without spot, sinless, who's going to die and give his life for the sins of the whole world. And they didn't quite understand all of that then, but you and I do this side of the cross. We've seen God's love, his mercy, his kindness, his compassion, and his grace all in the sacrifice of Jesus. That on that day, and we could call that day on Calvary the true day of atonement, Jesus literally said, I love you this much, as he spread out his hands and was nailed to that cross so that you and I may not lose hope, that we not lose heart. That's what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. He did it to defeat death, to defeat Satan, and to prepare a home for you and for me. We understand that love, that compassion, and that mercy even more so than the psalmist and the Jews that lived at that time. How much more so should our actions and our words express our gratitude and praise and our love for our magnificent Savior? Our hearts are to be filled with thanksgiving to God through Jesus and should be heard and seen in our words and actions. That's what Colossians 3.17 is all about. It's telling us that everything we do in life ought to be to praise our God. These are the call to give thanks from Psalm 100. But he doesn't just give us a call. He gives us the cause to give thanks in Psalm 103 and verse 5. You know, lots of times as we read through the scripture, 
we ask the why of a thing. Why are we told to do that? Why on earth did that happen? Why did he do that? And sometimes the why is given, and most times the why is not. It's just a narrative. This is what happened. This is what was said. Or God tells us to do something. We're to give of our means on the first day of the week. We are to sing. We are to pray. And in our singing, musical instruments are omitted. They were able to use them in the Old Testament. Why can't we use them in the New Testament? The why is not given. We're told that the songs that come out of our mouths is the fruit of our lips. That's the sacrifice God wants. And that ought to suffice. We're not given the why. One of the things that when he tells us we are to come into his presence with thanksgiving and come into his presence with praise, the psalmist here is going to give us the why. And so we're going to spend some time talking about that. He gives us several reasons why all the world should worship and serve God Almighty and not any other created thing in the universe. One, number one in verse three, he is our creator. It is he who made us and we are his. Truly, if it were not for God, none of us would exist. Not only did he create us, he created everything around us, everything we need to live. That's what Colossians 1, 16 to 17 says. And in this passage, Colossians 1, 16 to 17, Jesus is revealed as the creator. And we're told that he created all things for him, by him, and through him. And that he holds all things together. And so we look in Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. It says he sustains us. He holds it all together by the word of his power or the power of his word. That is power. That Jesus holds everything that we see around us together. And with his word, one day he will call an end to it. That's power beyond anything we can even think or comprehend. Since he created us, 1 Peter 2, 9, we're going to read this passage a little later on, so if you want to put a marker there. Since he created us, we belong to him. We're told that we are his possession. We're special people to Jesus. <clears throat> we're also told he is our shepherd in verse 3. When I read this, I can't think, I can't help but think of Psalm 23 in the first line. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He is our shepherd. A shepherd in those times was more than just a mere farmer. There were farmers and then there were shepherds. A shepherd was a guide for the sheep. He was a protector for the sheep. He was a provider for the sheep. And the shepherd would see to their every need. And when I think of a protector, I can't help but think of David. Here's Goliath for 40 days challenging the army of Israel. And David is sent by his father. Remember, he's referred to as kind of the runt of the litter. He wasn't even invited to the party when Samuel went to anoint a king. He's left in the field with what? The sheep. David's a shepherd. Well, his father calls him out of the fields and says, your brothers are serving in the war with the Philistines, and I want you to take a care package to them. And what he really wanted him to do is ascertain how they're doing and bring word back to his father. His father was concerned and wanted to know if his boys were okay. David gets there and he, I think he forgot all about the care package because he just could not stand hearing Goliath challenge the army of Israel and see the army of Israel shake and scatter with fear. And so David says, what is happening that you're allowing this blasphemer to challenge you and to blaspheme the name of God? And he's taken before Saul. And Saul is looking at him saying, you're no soldier. This guy's been a soldier his entire life, and you're going to go against him. And you remember what David said, what he did as a shepherd? He said, I've been a shepherd over my father's flock. And a bear came to get the sheep, and I took him out with my own hands. A lion came to get my father's sheep. I grabbed him by the mane, and I smote him in the face, and I killed him with my bare hands. Saul says... Oh, send this kid out. <laughs> a shepherd gets in the fight. A shepherd protects the sheep. Jesus, in John chapter 10, he makes a great case of what a hired hand and a shepherd really look like. He says when danger and trouble comes against the sheep, the hired hand runs. Because he says, oh no, my life isn't worth that. But the shepherd... The shepherd will fight that lion, will fight that bear, will fight those wolves and coyotes. Even if it takes his life, he will give his life to protect those sheep. 
Jesus says, I am that good shepherd. I will lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus is the good shepherd, he says in John 10 and verse 11. In John 10, 11 to 18 and verses 26 to 30, Jesus says that his sheep know his voice and he knows who they are. He says, they're not going to follow a stranger. They're going to follow me. They know my voice. It ought to be no surprise then as we look at David extolling the virtues of what a shepherd really is and then showing that shepherd king on the field of battle facing Goliath while Goliath is fully armored, fully armed, and David's armed with five stones and a sling. But he says, my God is bigger than you. That was what he said. The battle belongs to the Lord. You can't stand against God. And Goliath fell. That Israel saw that day the difference between King Saul and King David. Even though he was not king yet, he had already been anointed. And he showed them what a shepherd is willing to do. Jesus came to show us what a shepherd is willing to do. Having done nothing wrong, being innocent, being blameless, our good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. And we ought to know his voice and sing our praises and our thanksgiving because he is our creator. He is our shepherd. The psalmist also tells us we have cause to give thanks because God is good, verse 5. The Hebrew, her, the Hebrew word here refers to something that is desirable, beautiful, or pleasing. <clears throat> and we understand God is morally good. We understand that. He's holy. He's perfect. But this word means he's good all around. That everything about him is good. He's beautiful. He's desirable. This good is the same word used in Genesis chapter 1. When God made everything, when he created everything, after everything was created, he said, and he saw that it was good. And then at the end, in, in Genesis 1, 4 through 25, everything that was created, he says, and it was good. And then in verse 31, it says, after all things were created, including male and female in his image, God says, and he saw that they were very good. The Hebrew word there means pleasing, whole, perfect, complete, beautiful. That's what it means. That's the Hebrew word here the psalmist is using of God. He is beautiful. He is complete. You know, that's what God is. He is beautiful. David wrote in Psalm 34 and verse 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. It's that Hebrew word. He is complete. He is whole. He is desirable. He's pleasing. He's beautiful. O taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Not only is he good, he is loving. <clears throat> I'm going to just summarize the various English translations here by just saying God is loving. The ESV, the English Standard Version, refers to God's steadfast love. The New American that I'm reading from, and if you're reading it with me, says he is loving kindness. The Net Bible, the New English Translation, another uh, favorite one of mine, refers to God's loyal love. The King James and New King James simply say his mercy. He is merciful. The love here is more than just affection. It is undying, never-ending, loyal love. The Hebrew term here is kesed, Strong's 26 or 2617. And it could be thought of as the Old Testament version of agape love, Strong's 26 in the Greek dictionary. We understand what agape love is, that we talk about that all the time. That's that love that seeks the best interest of someone else. It puts someone else's interest above your own. This is kind of the Old Testament version of agape. It's kesed. And what it means is that we put someone else's interests above our own. In this case, God is loving. He loves his creation above all else. And so think about the how incredibly comforting that ought to be, that God is eternally loyal to his people. In Deuteronomy 7, 9, here's what Moses wrote. Moses wrote, know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love. That is that kesed. He says steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. 
It's speaking of this covenant love. God will not break the covenant. And Moses is calling on his people to not break that covenant. But we know Jewish history, don't we? They broke that covenant time and time again. And the ultimate answer and fulfillment to that covenant was the good shepherd, was Jesus. Fully God, fully man. The only one qualified in the history of mankind to make that sacrifice. And a cause to give thanks is because God is faithful. The New King James says his truth endures to all generations. And that's probably as good a description of the sense of this Hebrew word as we can make. God is honest. He is steadfast. He is trustworthy. He's a God of integrity, of consistency. He keeps his promises. He who calls us is faithful is what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5.24. Paul also wrote to Titus in Titus 1-2, God never lies. He cannot tell a lie. You and I, we can tell lies. Sometimes we deceive ourselves more than anything. God cannot tell a lie. God never lies. That's why he is trustworthy. He is faithful. God's truth endures. His promises never fail. And as we go through the Old Testament, Even in the most minute detail, his promises never fail. We serve an awesome God. We serve a God who is loving and faithful. We serve a God who is our creator and good shepherd. A God who laid down his own life in earthly form so that we might be washed from our sins. And more than that, that one day we would be invited to enter into his eternal rest and live with him forever you know no other pagan god throughout time whether you're looking at egyptian mythology or persian mythology babylonian mythology greek mythology roman mythology none of them none of those pagan gods ever made such a declaration to mere mortals i'm going to invite you into my house and you're going to dwell with me forever but god our loving and good and faithful creator our good shepherd said, you keep my commandments. That's what Jesus said, John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And one day, you will live with me forever. In fact, Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 18, we're to comfort one another with those very words, that we will be with him forever. It is all these attributes combined that call us to praise him, to give thanks to God, and to worship him. No one else has the power to give and sustain life. No one else guides, protects, and cares for us like God does. No one else is glorious and completely beautiful as God. No one loves with the same loyal, eternal love as God has. No one else keeps their promises as God keeps his. There's no one like the Lord. And so, we are, as we read Psalm 100, we are encouraged and admonished to shout joyfully to him to serve him with gladness in our hearts, to come into his presence with singing from our heart, enter his gates with thanksgiving because he is our creator, our sustainer, and our guide. We are his people. We're for his own possession to do his will. The Scottish Psalter, as it appeared in the Geneva Psalter, published 1551, derived its words from Psalm 100. It's in Psalm 60 in our hymn books, and it reads thus from 1551, so it's Old English, All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Him serve with mirth, his praise foretell. Come ye before him and rejoice. Know that the Lord is God indeed. Without our aid he did us make. We are his flock, he doth us feed. And for his sheep he doth us take. O enter then his gates with praise. Approach with joy his courts unto. Praise, laud, and bless his name always. For it is seemly so to do. For why? The Lord our God is good. His mercy is forever sure. His truth at all times firmly stood and shall from age to age endure. Beautiful words. And as we sing those those words still today, it's in our hymn book number 60. We're reminded of the words of the psalmist in Psalm 100 who said, Shout joyfully to the Lord. Give thanks and give praise because he is good. He is loving. He is our creator. He is our shepherd And he is faithful. Look at what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. 
reading from the New American, it says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And anyone and everyone should be thankful to God for their existence and God's providing care. And only those who are God's children can truly proclaim his excellencies to the world around them. Because we understand his love, his mercy, his compassion. Having obeyed the gospel, we are, his, we are the recipients of that salvation. Only those who have come out of darkness and into light by obeying the gospel can truly and fully give thanks to God through their words and their actions as Colossians 3.17 calls us to do. Can you? If you're sitting here with us this morning, can you truly and fully give your thanks and praise to God in word and deed? Have you obeyed the gospel? If you are with us this morning and you're not a Christian, you need to become one. To repent of your sins, to be baptized into his name, that you might rise from the waters, no longer living for yourself, but living for that good shepherd, living for that creator who created you for good works. That you might rise and walk in newness of life. And this morning, if you are a Christian in error, that means a Christian not living the way that you should. Perhaps your example hasn't been what it is. Maybe you're coming to God in his presence grudgingly and not with praise and thanksgiving in your heart. Now's the time to make correction and make it right. And you can do so by asking for forgiveness, asking your brothers and sisters to pray with you and for you on your behalf. Come forward, whatever your request is, make it known while we stand and sing.